We're now turning to the challenges uh, uh, of investment opportunities in the aviation sector. I'm going to be handing over to uh, Vijay uh, to take over the moderation for that. And that is coming up very shortly. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the aviation panel. My name is Vijay Punasamy, your humble moderator, and I invite you to fasten your seatbelts and welcome our panelists. Suha Al Ada, Wild Jordanian Airlines Vice President, Treasury and Management Accounts. Gavin Watts, Yoti's Client Transformation and Delivery Director. And Dale Keller, Chief Executive, UK Board of Airline Representatives. During our slightly delayed 45 minute trip, I will start with a few remarks, interact with our panel address as many of the questions or comments you submit and conclude with some closing remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, airlines have traditionally survived and thrived by being the arteries of an interconnected world and by being the wings of booming global tourism and trade. Last year, travel and tourism contributed according to WTTC 8.9 trillion US dollars to global GDP and 330 million jobs worldwide. Airlines invested billions in next generation aircraft and technology and in recruiting and training personnel to meet and stimulate an ever increasing demand for business, work related, leisure, religious, medical, educational, friends and families travel by air. Sky was not the limit, as the long-term projections predicted a doubling in air travel over the next two decades. Then came COVID-19, which continues to infect and kill millions, operationally and financially challenging most people and businesses. It has grounded almost everyone, locked down international tourism and clipped the wings of airlines, except for those operating cargo, repatriation, domestic, and some limited international flights. The longer COVID chokes the world, the worse it gets for airlines and their stakeholders. With practically no flown revenues, but with massive debts and onerous Commitments for aircraft and engine purchases, huge monthly lease payments for aircraft and engines, significant labor and other recurrent costs. Even the well-run and financially healthy airlines have not been able to survive without external support. The poorly run and financially challenged airlines, which were already destined to fail before COVID, clearly need much more than external financial support if they have any chance of escaping their expected fate. WTTC estimates that if the current travel restrictions continue until the end of this year, 174 million jobs will be lost globally and global GDP would lose 4.7 trillion US dollars from travel and tourism. IATA expects airlines to lose 84.3 billion US dollars by the end of the year. Now, I put it to you that even if discretionary travel becomes possible again, I fear that the ongoing painful human and economic losses, the risk of being infected and being in contact with someone who is, the tests and quarantines at both ends of a flight, the risk associated with a positive COVID test and treatment in a foreign country, the risk of a lockdown at either ends of a flight will impact people's desire and ability to indulge in discretionary travel. Business travel will also be impacted for a long time because business continue to suffer and people are adapting to cost-effective virtual tools like we are now. Enhanced climate change awareness will also have an increasing impact on travel and tourism. So my first question is actually to Dale, as to whether the opening of borders is the silver bullet for aiding airlines. 
If it's not, then what more is required? Uh, good morning, yeah. afternoon, everybody. Um, I think it's it's more than a silver bullet. It's absolutely essential. I mean, it, 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 it's the base of everything we do. You know, as airlines, you know, we move people and goods. We are a connectivity business. We are a national infrastructure asset. And uh, without that uh, uh, bilateral border openings, uh, we simply don't have the, the case to resume services at any scale. So that's really what it's hinging on. So I think um, uh, a huge part of our effort uh, with, with uh, the UK government, because that's really my responsibility here in the UK, but working with IATA and uh, other bodies about what we do pan-Europe and globally, is um, that is our number one focus right now. You know, we talk about um, a, a recovery. Actually, we haven't even got through the restart, let alone the recovery phase yet. Thanks, Dale. Gavin? Yeah, to add to that, the, even if you open the borders, the, the next key element really is creating that confidence in the traveler to actually step foot in the airplane in the first instance. So they need to be confident that they're traveling in a safe space. So there need to be programs put in place um, with the airlines and airports to allow people to understand they are traveling in that uh, COVID-free environment. And then they, there needs to be uniformity uh, across health authorities with the, the rule sets that they're using to allow you to um, progress through immigration in the destination. Uh, as you kind of alluded to in your opening pitch, um, people are at fear of traveling right now for being stuck at their destination due to an impeding lockdown and the scrambling for a journey back by whatever route that might be to, to get home and not be stuck somewhere for months on end. So um, uniformity across um, countries and confluence uh, are two additional key things to the opening of those borders, in my view. Thank you. And, and Sura, do you, do you sense that opening of borders will actually help uh, airlines right now? Yeah, good afternoon. Um, thank you. Uh, I think opening the borders, um, it might help, but it's not the main, the main reason for the recovery. Uncertainty in the market, there's uncertainty between the customers. It will all depend on their behavior and their confidence to fly again. And uh, it's all, we, are all, we are all witnessing now the second wave of, of the COVID. So also the lockdowns and uh, the restrictions on travel are still there. So I think it's, it's a bit early. The recovery would take a longer time in order to get the customers back confidence into traveling again. Thank you very much. So basically opening the borders is uh, important, essential, but not enough uh, to actually allow the industry to recover. Uh, can I ask you, uh, and I'll start with Gavin because I know you, you'll have to leave earlier. Um, and I have actually a, a billion dollar question followed by a million dollar question. Uh, let me start with the billion dollar one. Uh, Gavin, when do you expect airlines to be viable again? Uh, I mean, I wish I had a crystal ball to answer that. I, I think it, it kind of depends on what demogra demographic of passenger you're looking at. So are you looking at the business traveler? Or are you looking at uh, the individual that is trying to go on a holiday uh, and really get on that break? Uh, I, I think we're probably going to see that latter market rebound relatively quickly. Uh, you know, if you look at some polls that have been done in the UK recently, um, a lot of people have indicated that they would be willing to get on an airplane to go on, on holiday, uh, especially as we, we approach the winter months here in the UK. So I think we will see a pickup in that market. Uh, one of your um, earlier interviews with the partner from PwC, he, he predicted there was going to be some years before the business market came back to what we would expect this time 12 months ago. And, and you know, technology such as, such as Zoom that we're on now is kind of aid in that as well. Okay, and, and Shua? Um, I think airlines today are facing the most challenging time. Um, the expectation of revenue drops is more than $400 billion for the industry. It will take time to recover, and definitely airlines will be reshaped in a different, in a different situation. And um, when we look into the drop in revenues or the losses that might be generated by, by the airlines, we have to keep in mind that it's not only the losses of the revenue or the losses that the airlines are incurring. 
it's also there's a huge effect on the liquidity levels and there's a huge effect on the value of the airline industry in total. Today, the value of the assets are dropping dramatically and the value of the airport slots and routes are dropping also the same. The value today of the assets is around 20 to 30 percent drop in value, which means that there is a complete meltdown of the valuation of the total industry. And I think this will take time to recover. So based on the, on the latest forecast, it will take maybe up to two or three years to get back to the level of 2019. Thank you, uh, Suha. And Dale? I think there's so many figures flying around the industry that actually I think we've become um, almost immune to this situation. I mean, if you whether you're talking about 84 billion or 80 billion, does it actually make much difference at this point? If we're talking about an 88% drop in passenger traffic uh, globally in September, as opposed to 84%, what difference would that fundamentally make? They're numbers that we've never seen before. So I think in you know in airline boardrooms around the world, you know the CEOs are first of all dealing with their cash burn. Uh, so uh, you're talking about a recovery. I, I think I are to publish figures where airlines are looking at a, uh, a admittedly decreasing, but you're looking at a cash burn right the way through 2021. And then you've got the situation is coming out of this crisis when we eventually do, and of course we will, um, as uh, we get uh, vaccines, testings, borders open, there is a, a, a built up uh, demand and propensity to travel that can be retapped. But uh, there's a lot of talk about getting back to 2019 figures. Again, I think that's a futile figure because even if we get to the same traffic numbers, the business will not look the same. There's a structural change going on here, which happens after every shock. This will be the biggest structural change the sector's ever seen. So there's gonna be winners and losers. So um, CEOs around the world are looking for early advantage, uh, early advantage coming out of this, that they will be the winning carrier, not the losing carrier. And the, and the same goes for destinations. There'll be winning destinations and losing destinations coming out of this. You, you raise an interesting point, and, and that actually was going to be my million dollar question, uh, which is actually in terms of uh, when does the industry uh, ever go back to 200, 2019 uh, levels of performance. And maybe uh, listening to you, Dale, the question would probably be better put in terms of when would a specific airline be able to go back to its best performance of 2019, as opposed to an industry uh, going back to that level? W would you agree with that, Dale? Uh, yeah, I think it's going to be highly variable and uh, and quite regional. So you, what you might find is some low cost carriers in certain markets might do quite well next summer. I mean, they're not going to get back to 2019, but I think for the summer traffic, provided we've got market confidence and we've got testing or vaccine regimes in place, I think we can have a, a reasonable summer. I think in terms of um, shoulder and winter traffic or stimulating um, off of peak travel or business market, I think much tougher. Uh, we might find that some Asia Pacific markets or domestic operations do quite well. So I think uh, for some carriers, we could be looking at a, a long-term recovery up to 2028, 20, 2029 20, potentially, or some carriers could be back in the black in uh, 2020 to 2023, hopefully. And, and I guess it would also depend on whether that particular airline had a, a cargo operation of, of significance and had a domestic market of significance uh, to, to operate to. Well, the belly, remember that a lot of the cargo has traditionally traveled in uh, belly hold of passenger fleets. And of course, that's been displaced to, to those carriers with cargo only fleets or those who have Although lately, lately, cargo has been carried in the passenger seats as well. Yes, who, who have repurposed <laughs> their fleets. But as the passenger volume comes back and the belly hold capacity increases, that advantage to those who are focused on cargo will then diminish and will, be, will get back to a bit more equilibrium once more. So I I think that's a, a short-term advantage to those who are heavily in that market. Sua, how do you see those uh, airlines, or if you want to talk about uh, Wild Jordanian in particular, how do you see that uh, playing out? Okay, um, first I agree with all the points that Dale have mentioned earlier. 
uh, the recovery will, will be different from one region to another and from one airline to another. Low-cost carriers are expected uh, to recover faster than uh, commercial airlines. In terms of Royal Jordanian, Royal Jordanian is considered to be uh, a small airline. So I think it's more flexible and it's more, um, it would be much more easier to turn around the company in a faster period than other airlines. And especially with the destinations that are considered to be short to medium haul destinations. International traffic might take a bit, a bit longer, but I think mm -hmm. for the inter-regional traffic, it would be much faster. I would expect that by 2022, 2023, the airline would be able to turn around uh, into an And definitely this will be done through uh, restructuring the business, resizing uh, the network, resizing the fleet, and shaping the airline to look differently uh, after, after the, the COVID. Okay. Gavin? Uh, I think that the previous year have summed it up quite well, really. Like, like just said it depends on the model of the airline uh, it's an opportunity to restructure we've seen several airlines do that already uh, those with large domestic markets as Dale has said will will probably likely to see a quicker rebound than those that are solely flying internationally where they're effectively there are a lot more um, uncontrollables for them okay if I could take you uh, to another area of, of interest uh, because I think throughout the, the even the, this conference, a lot have been mentioned about uh, building uh, passenger confidence, uh, and and clearly uh, in in a time of of a global crisis of confidence, let's say in in, in air travel, uh, trust is key. Now, do you think that calling on governments to find the right balance? between public health concerns and supporting a sector upon which millions of people depend actually serves the interest of travel and tourism? Who wants to go at that? It's, it's probably the most sensitive question I can put to all of you. Uh, but I think if, if we're talking about rebuilding confidence, we need to be able to understand that the messaging is key and what message we intend people to understand. So is the notion of calling on governments to balance health concerns and saving a sector, which admittedly is very important, but does that kind of message resonate well with governments or with the traveling public, or even a non-traveling public? Sua? I think to start with the balance is, is a bit difficult. In terms of governments, I think governments have supported the aviation industry. So looking into figures when the first wave took place, uh, the governments have injected above 160 billion in the industry, which means that the governments understand and really are caring about the aviation industry and they know the positive effect of the aviation industry on the economy. But definitely the balance between the health concern and the economic concern is a difficult question, and it varies from one country to another. Gavin? Yeah, Vijay, it's a very difficult balancing act for any government and politician. Um, there has been a lot of criticism here in the UK in terms of the UK government not taking action. They're still to really implement a testing program for people arriving back from destinations that are not on a, um, on a on a corridor, which is then having the the effect outside of the current lockdown of those individuals deciding to travel, as they can't afford to have fourteen days of, of isolation potentially not working. So, I think um, industry needs to take a lead to demonstrate to governments the art of the possible in creating that confidence and deliver delivering safe aeroplanes. And when the government can see that those solutions are already available, they can be delivered, they will not take resources away from NHS in the UK's case, uh, then they should be armed with the evidence to act upon. Dale. Look, I think the industry has done a good job and it has taken a lead. Um, before ICAO even came out with the um, guidelines, uh, global guidelines on um, uh, safe travel, 
airlines had already actively implemented most of those. And of course, they sit at the table and help it get developed. So, you know, industry ahead of governments. Uh, the second one is on testing. Uh, there's been airports and airlines collaborating on testing programs around the world. But the, the big problem in the blocker is that the governments are once again following the industry and taking too long. So it, it, uh, governments are working on modeling and not real world data. The industry is trying to provide data. Governments are going, well, yes, but that's not our data. Or we don't acknowledge that data. So we're saying you need to become part of the trial. You, you need to back us on this. We need your help. We will do the legwork. But there's no point in having a trial if the passenger um, would still have to go through quarantine or pay for a test for no benefit. And there's no point in the industry making further huge investments in these trials without the governments going, we will actually be part of it and we will take on board the data you provide that will supplement our existing modeling. And in terms of consumer confidence, I think there's a large number of people globally who are ready to get on an aircraft. They can see what the um, airlines are doing. Actually, the public health experts in most countries acknowledge that the airport and aircraft environment is extremely good. An aircraft environment is far better than a, a restaurant or a supermarket or virtually any other indoor environment. And that is acknowledged by public health experts. The issue is, um, travel restrictions and quarantines. Now, once we get rid of that, all of the early adopters, they, they will travel again. There's always going to be a, an element of the population who are reluctant to travel for some time, but they will come around when they see that it is safe and that we're not adding to the local um, infection rates in various countries. And, you know, Theresa May, our ex-Prime Minister, said in the House of Commons here a few weeks ago, you know, the problem is not aviation. Uh, it, the, the problem is local transmission. And, and that is a good point. I mean, I, even if we recognize, and I think there's been, uh, there have been some studies also on that, confirming that the, uh, the transmission rate uh, in flight is, is insignificant. And, and probably that's probably the safest part of your journey. Uh, when you're on uh, on board, assuming people actually wear a mask and, and so on. But the challenge, of course, is your travel does not only include uh, the time you spend on the aircraft. It will involve uh, traveling to an airport, uh, going through an airport, and an arrival at another airport, and then uh, into a destination. And these, I suppose, are the risk factors which the airlines have no control over. And, and presumably cannot have control over. Uh, and you also are dealing with governments, which must also be on many other issues, particularly to deal with uh, health, public health, and I suppose economies uh, uh, basically crashing uh, uh, because of the uh, pandemic. So in, in terms of your, when you engage with government, and I'm probably talking more to Dale here, uh, you see governments, when you specifically uh, talk to governments, do they see you as somebody who is genuinely trying to work with them to find a solution which is almost a win-win for them and for the sector? Or they see you as a, a basically a, a self-interested uh, advocate uh, of a, for an industry which is uh, determined to get back uh, into operations? Do you see a sense of, 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 if you want, trust, trustworthiness uh, in your discussion with the government or governments are kind of uh, not so convinced? What, what is your feeling? Um, I think governments do know the value of aviation. I just think that their bandwidth to deal with any individual sector is stretched the on breaking point at the moment and that the, the general public health has to come first. And that's not to say aviation, travel and tourism are not hugely important. And it goes beyond that. You know, we're also delivering global connectivity. It's not just about you know, tourism. So I think um, the, 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 the real problem we've got is that the, the WHO is too slow to give advice regarding different types of tests, such as antigen tests. 
we need testing regimes. And actually, IATA did research that 88% of passengers would like to have um, a, a uh, COVID test as part of the passenger journey and be happy for that. So we know that, that there's a real demand there for this. We need to be able but, to- but I, but, I, but I would stop you here, Dale, because you, you mentioned that uh, WHO was, uh, is a bit too slow. Yeah. But if I can take all of us back uh, nine months ago, wasn't WHO too fast then? When is Director General on 30th of January 2020 said, and I quote, the WHO does not recommend and actually opposes any restrictions for travel and trade and other measures against China. WHO even questioned quarantining airplane passengers who are not ill. I, I agree, but I think we've gone beyond that, and we're now we're in, now in a situation where we have a global pandemic, and we need testing. T testing is the the only way you'll get the confidence, and then for governments to reopen the borders. And we have not we're far from it. The problem is there's no direct guidance. We're going to have to wait some time for ICAO to come through with that guidance. So every country and even member states within the EU are doing their own thing. You know that doesn't work for a global industry like aviation. So we urge need to get some aligned thinking even if it's you know getting some corridors together get this working and so I, I, I think the will's there but the, the how has gone into the hard box I think they working with industry we can help them unlock that and make it happen and, and it can't come a moment too soon because none of us thought we'd be in this situation now that the, this uh, there was talk of a second wave but the the restart in summer never really took hold so uh you know everybody's uh cash positions and, and, and outlooks are much worse now than we ever expected to be at this point so the urgency is there i think we're making progress in the uk but um you know we're a long way from getting it right but i i do think that the in terms of balance you have to balance the economy with the national health but we're trying to be responsible and put forward solutions that actually look like a win-win, if you like. Uh, and Vijay, just to add one thing, there, there's, yeah. there's confusion with the passenger as well in all of this. So there are, there are multiple rule sets depending on where you're traveling, uh, the type of test that you can take to travel to that destination, the time frame that you need to have that test within, where you can have that test before you travel. Uh, and so the person that, that suffers in the middle of this it is the individual and, and it becomes very confusing and it's almost as in the two hard box to even try and contemplate that travel journey in the first instance. Yeah, and, and I guess it goes back to the point which was uh, made uh, often that you need a global response and a global uh, standard. And, and I guess uh, everybody will be looking to ICAO in a way to develop that uh, with the help, support of industry and, and government. But I guess there needs to be some international standard develop which are uh, uh which is going to be credible and and trusted by everybody and that will help generate the kind of confidence because governments will have to make the final call and i guess it can't be individual governments working separately it has to be some governments coming together and i guess ikeo is the the best platform for doing that and adopting uh standards for a safe uh, restart of the uh, air travel sector. Can I just, uh, and, and, and Gavin, please leave when you have to uh, and stay as long as you can. Uh, but I'd like to put another uh, different thought to, to you is when you expect, and I'll probably start with, um, with Dale, uh, when you think whether airlines will be able to withstand uh, credibly the new enhanced environmental challenges? Look, I, I, I think now is not the time to have the, the environmental uh, discussion. It, you, you know, governments have all been committing to building uh, back better. Um, the airline industry fully supports, uh, you, you know, the, 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 the global commitments we've made in the UK alone. The UK government and the airline industry is committed to net zero 2050. That is still on target. Let's not forget for one moment that in 2020, we're looking at at least a 40% reduction in global aviation fuel burn, probably actually with this 
second lockdowns is probably going to be a, a greater reduction than that. And then next year uh, could be a, a global 30% reduction in fuel burn. Plus true, true, the, but if I, if I were to and the four engine that. aircraft out the fleet. So, so those four, uh, let me those four air, engine aircraft, including entire fleets of 747s, uh, aren't coming back in. So I think that actually we're well on track at the moment to meet those obligations because by the time we get even get back to 2019 overall levels, we'll actually have newer fleets, newer technologies, and we need those commitments. So this was never a two or three year target. It was always a 2050 target, which every year we make improvements. True. Uh, let, let me, uh, Sua, you, you want to come in on that and then I'm going to actually uh, make another point. But I think uh, I, I, I have to disagree with Dale uh, in the sense that when you say this is not the time to talk about the environment, I, I think the, the, the circumstances have so much changed in the last nine months that the environment is going to be uh, center of every discussion moving forward in, in many areas, including aviation. And, and whereas you correctly point out that aviation's contribution to climate change has significantly reduced over the last nine months, but it was not through a, a deliberate decision by the airline sector. Circumstances forced airlines to actually park most of its aircraft, and that led to a reduction in uh, CO2 emissions. The question now is, and I think we have to be prepared for that, people are going to expect uh, uh, explanations as to whether you can keep to a level of, of uh, environmental impact closer to what we've seen this year going forward, as opposed to, in a way, going back to the 2019 trend where the, the uh, emissions were increasing. So, I mean, that, that's the, the challenge is what can the industry do more to step up? Because see, the, the deals which were done, like Corsia and so on, were all pre-COVID. And I think we need to actually address those issues in this current uh, mindset now. I don't think what more do you think, under... Sua, mm. Let me ask Sua, Dale, one minute. If, if, Sua, what do you think airlines need to do more to show their, let's say, green credentials yeah, moving I forward? I think um, the effect that we have, the positive effect that we have on the environment was only a one-time effect. So definitely once the operation will get back, you'll get into the, the, the previous station. Now, what will airlines have to do? I think it's more into, uh, into investing into um, highly, um, highly efficient and better operational aircrafts and better technology in order to reduce. But I'm not sure whether airlines will have the liquidity to now invest in such kind of, of, uh, of a fleet in the coming few years. Uh, they are challenging. It's a, it's a very challenging time for the industry to come and invest in a new fleet. But definitely on the longer run, investment in new fleet will help in the CO2 emission. But would you agree, Dale, if I were to say to you that given, as we know, that the, uh, the recovery is going to be slow, right? which means that the environmental impact is also going to be fairly minimal in the next year or two. And that should give, let's say, the airline industry the time to start thinking, okay, as the industry starts ramping up, what do we do to try to further reduce the uh, environmental impact? Because I, I suspect that the, the global community will be asking for more uh, from the sector than ever before. I, I think we are not in a 2019 or even January 2020 situation here. I think the, the pandemic and the uh, consequences it has had, and the fact that people have seen a positive improvement in the environment over the last few months will cause people, whether it's next gen or, uh, or people generally, to actually put more uh, emphasis on that af uh, aspect. And I think the industry would do well to work with whether it's ICAO and, 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 and others, to develop a, a solid response uh, to this. Well, I think uh, it is, and that was my original point. I, I, when I said it, now is not the time, you know, right now we're in survival mode. And to be honest, you, you know, that has to come first. We haven't got through a restart yet. So 
you, you better not get diverted from getting a restart and, and making your business survive and keeping people in jobs. Then we will move into that phase very quickly once we get into the recovery phase. So that was my point. Um, let's not forget that the industry was already making really good progress here. We need to do a much better communications job on this. Uh, but the reality is we were making good progress and the roadmap is still there. The roadmap is intact. If anything, this uh, COVID crisis has bought us a bit more time and, and got rid of the uh, older, most polluting aircraft quicker than the original timetable. So far from uh, people being worried that this COVID crisis is gonna mean lack of investment or lack of progress, I'm very confident that we're actually gonna be on track sooner than we would have been otherwise. And people should not get too alarmed about this. Just give the industry, you know, a few more months or a year to get itself uh, in the right place uh, before we get hammered too hard. That That is really a plea. But what you will see is a, a, a stronger um, drive from the industry for governments to invest in a sustainable aviation fuels network. That is where the industry simply won't have the investment available to create a scalable supply chain of those fuels. And uh, you know, it's never been an airlines uh, in an airlines remit to create a fuel source or a fuel supply network. Um, you know, that's been for others, and we will end, end, be at the end client. But we're going to need um, governments to help us with that. But certainly, um, as these older aircraft have taken out the. Um, the fleets, once we get growth back, a lot of those aircraft would have been parked for so long, it's probably going to be more expensive to bring them back in than it is to be able to probably get new aircraft at attractive prices from the manufacturers anyway. So I'm convinced that we're going to see a quite a large fleet uh, uh, regeneration as a result as well. So I think there's some really good positives here. And I just ask everyone not to be too alarmed that the industry is not doing much right here for a few months. We're, we're in a good space, yeah. I think. So uh, let me give you the, the, the last word before I, I wrap up. Uh, are, are you optimistic that the uh, airline industry can uh, step up to this uh, environmental challenge at the right time? Um, I think, yes, the industry can, can step up in the right time. It will take some time, but I, I think they can. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on your behalf, thank uh, Suha, Gavin, and, and Dale and uh, for this most engaging session. We could have gone, carried on for, I guess, a few more hours, uh, but I guess our time is, is, is now almost up. But by way of conclusion, let me tell you that I think we must wake up to the fact that the new normal requires new mindsets to find new solutions. Now, beyond innovation and digitalization, there is an ever-growing need to create a more socially, environmentally, and economically sustainable travel and tourism model. Nobody knows how all this will play out, but we must all do our trustworthy part to rebuild confidence in air travel and enable airlines to help the world take off. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.